Excuse me. Don't disturb my friend. He's dead tired. Welcome. Woo! People are excited and we are excited. It is a lovely day to be here today, Jim. Lovely First day. inaugural episode of the Front Row Cinema Podcast. I'm your host, excited. James O'Reilly, with me. TJ Tromboli, our esteemed movie analyst. It's great to be here, Jim. I've got goosebumps. I'm just raring to go. I can feel them. We can feel them. Basically, we're going to see a new movie every Friday. It's 52 weeks, people. 52 movies. We're going to review that movie for you, tell you what it's all about, break it down. Break uh, this it week, down. we're focusing on Arnold Schwarzenegger's Woo! big return to the silver screen. 12 years I've been waiting for this, Jim. 12 years. Long time. He's uh, returning in The Last Stand. Oh, baby. Return to his action roots. Great movie. We'll get to that in a minute. We're going to kick it off with a bit we like to call Greatest Movie Ever. Greatest Movie Ever. Okay, so we watched Commando this week. Excellent fucking movie, if I must say so. That just fucking pinnacle of action. Uh, just action. It was better than I remembered. Uh, Schwarzenegger plays an ex-commando, believe it or not, named John Matrix. We Can we just pause here for a second and just talk about this name? Just say the name again one more time for me. John Matrix. John fucking Matrix. That is the most badass name I've ever heard. Like, who, who wrote the movie again? Stephen E. D'Souza. Stephen E. If it wasn't a, it's all right. If it wasn't an accredited writer already, Stephen E. D'Souza is just the fucking man coming up with the pinnacle of names. John Matrix. That's a terrifying fucking name. I don't know what right? And you're scared. <laughs> I haven't even seen like for people who haven't even seen the movie. You hear that fucking name and you're terrified. <laughs> just so he's the next coming out. He's retired. Um... So bad dudes come back, kidnap him and his daughter. Bad they, idea. They stick him on a plane, they need him to assassinate somebody. Doesn't really matter. Breaks off the plane, has 11 hours till that plane lands to save his daughter and kill literally everyone that's against him. <laughs> just, just a great plot structure right there. Just amazing. All right, so uh, what sticks out to you about this movie? Well, the first thing we got to comment on right there, right there in your plot description, the ticking time bomb of him having 11 hours to find this girl is literally the greatest like device I've ever seen used in movies. Like, <laughs> people use it all the time, but you never get it better than you get it in 80s action, like, he gets off this plane. All he has on is the clothes on his back. back yeah, starting totally from scratch. Eleven hours to find his daughter. Like, no idea where she could be. No idea. Just uh, th- things were looking pretty desperate at the beginning of this movie. Like, and it's just so great because it's a testament to Schwarzenegger's acting. Because those entire scenes leading up to where they put him on the plane, you just see him just calculating how he's gonna get out of this real quick and oh, yeah. just hunt these people he's, down. He's never playing yeah. ball. From, he's, like from, from the, the jump, he's yeah. not like. All right, I'll go to the airport with. Yeah. Only until I can figure out a way to get past your guy and get fucking out of here. <laughs> Which just, it's just the greatest just fucking plot device. Which really, really gets that. When you really get down to it, John Matrix is the most badass man alive. He, and that's what makes this movie. Yeah, that's what makes the movie, is that there is no better hero that you could find than fucking John Matrix. Look anywhere. Find any movie and you come bring me a hero and John Matrix is better than him. You just can't beat him. Like, just take the opening fucking scene where we see John Matrix, you know? Walking through the forest, we get a close-up on the calves, we get a close-up on his fucking bulging bicep. He's Mm -hmm. carrying something. You don't even know he's fucking carrying it. You just see he's fucking flexing, like, out of control. And then then they pan out, and he's literally just shoulder-carrying the biggest tree you've ever seen. It literally (laughs) is the longest fucking tree. Like, it just, it's gotta be, like, ten feet long, and and he's he's carrying it like he's fucking just carrying a picnic. Basket. He like, comes up. He comes up. He starts chopping wood. You see, like a wide shot of a log cabin that you yeah. just have to assume he built. Yeah, you got to believe at this point that he took all these logs, cut them down, and just built this fucking home for him and his I wouldn't even go as far as to say he built it that afternoon. Like, <laughs> I would be surprised if he erected this in like literally just like a few hours. <laughs> like he's just the greatest fucking hero right there. Couple of quick hits. 
John Matrix can smell bad guys coming from down west. Thank you. That, I'm glad that you caught on to that besides just me. The best part has to be in that movie. He's standing there with his two guards, looks out into the forest, and takes off with his daughter as the two guards get blown down. And the only explanation that he has is that he smelt the bad guys coming downwind. He smelt the bad guys coming. Like, the other guy didn't even think that was a possibility. He was like, wait, you think I could smell them coming? And Swordsaker just retorts, I did. It's like, what? Walks up to the girl, rips a car seat out of her car. Uh, just, just bare hands. Just rips it. Bare head, just great. Just meets this girl, rips it out so he can sit in there, and as she drives following him, he won't be seen. Think about the strength that it's first gonna take to just rip out a fucking car seat. And he does it with just like whoa, and just palms that shit out of there. Like just unbelievably, just the greatest action movie hero of... And not, oh. not to mention he jumps out of a moving airplane. Yes, he does. Uh, he, so, not, not only does he jump out of a moving airplane, but he finds the way to... Man, like, I, on a plane, I have no idea where the fuck I'm going. I wouldn't be able to find out how to get into the bottom of this fucking plane where they store everything, let alone find where the fucking wheels are. And he just, like, makes a beeline for that shit, like, immediately. John Matrix is pretty badass. John Matrix is just the but, fucking... For every badass superhero, we have to have a villain. And this movie does have a pretty great villain. Pretty great in the sense that he's fucking horrible. I, I, I don't ever I don't ever think I believed that this guy could beat John Matrix just based on his physical appearance. Oh he yeah. This man pretty is out of shape for he, a commando. Like you see Schwarzenegger when he's coming up onto the island and he's just got nothing on but a fucking speedo and he's huge. And then, this is the biggest man you've seen. And then you see the bad guy and he's just got the fattest fucking stomach you've ever seen. He's got a gut. Yeah. He's got a huge Freddie Mercury gut. mustache. Yeah. Basically, this guy is the fat man's Freddie Mercury. Like, I was convinced that it was Freddie Mercury in this movie that and, uh, reincarnated. I'm interested to see if you picked up on this. He had a little bit of a crush on John Matrix. Oh, like he was in love with John Matrix. From the second you find out that this guy used to be in Matrix's clan, and then Matrix got rid of him because he was too, like, fucking fucked up, you just see how, like, much this affected this guy. He was just like, oh, I can't be with my man Matrix anymore. Like, I, I wasn't sure if he was going to have sex with him or try and kill him at yeah. the end. I was pretty <laughs> sure that he was going to kill him and then try and have sex with him. Like, if this movie, that would have that would have been a big twist ending right there. He kills Schwarzenegger, and then his daughter Jenny just has to sit there and watch as the fat man's Freddie Mercury just fucks Schwarzenegger's corpse. So... <laughs> so, all right, moving on from that. Um, just at some point, these two guys have to come to a head in this uh, movie. Yeah, they got uh, a clash. The way D'Souza went with this one was he decided to give Schwarzenegger a lot of guns and have him infiltrate a military base. Not only infiltrate a military base, Schwarzenegger just basically did he was, a mass... He wasn't using a lot of stealth. Yeah. There was no stealth. He literally came in, just started murdering people, set claymores everywhere, and just murdered literally an entire military facility of these people, descendants of, like, Val Verde, or wherever the fuck that it was that they were trying to be. And you have to consider it this fact. Schwarzenegger pretty much just committed a mass genocide. He kills... 83 people in that ending. They're all going to be descendants of the same race, pretty much. Like, that's mass genocide. <laughs> he just fucking murders everybody. He goes, there's, there's a lot of scenes of him just, like, walking through open fields, no yeah. cover, just mowing guys no, down. Like, when he picks up the M16 and is literally just standing out in the open, just gunning motherfuckers down... It's just the pinnacle of how badass John Matrix really is. Like sure. you, you could consider him no matter what mission he was going on. He just went in, just busted open the front door, and just started gunning motherfuckers down. <laughs> just to put it into perspective, we had 105 people die in this movie. I want to say no more than 10 of them died before, before he they, went into this before island. Before he lands on this island. Maybe, like, six people die before <laughs> he lands on this island. And then he gets there, and all just hell breaks fucking loose. And it's great because I love throughout the whole movie they have that that one guy, the general that he used to work for, Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. And the general is just like one step behind Schwarzenegger's yeah, like And it just keeps going him. like if if uh, if Matrix is on the case, there's gonna be a lot more bloodshed, a lot more bodies piling up. And he was right. And he was right. <laughs> they say it best at the end of the line when Matrix walks up with his daughter and the general lands on the uh, General Kirby lands on the place and just walks up and just goes you leave anything for us? So it's like he looks back and just goes, just bodies. Just like, 
the pinnacle of who John Matrix is. He leaves no man around, and it's just great. Greatest movie ever. I'd say that was a success. We uh, we wanted to overreact, and I think we overreacted. Uh, it's a good, uh, good, good job. Moving on, though, we're gonna we're gonna get to the the real meat and potatoes of this right now. The main issue. We're talking about the last stand. Oh yeah. Who the hell are you? I'm the sheriff. Arnold Schwarzenegger returns to the big screen in the last stand. Uh. Directed by Kim Ji Woon, written by Andrew Nauer. Cool. Don't really know if I'm saying those right, but who cares? Yeah. Forget those guys. All right, uh, real quick before we get started, I want to ask you about trailers. Uh, this Ooh. this podcast is really going to be about the whole movie going experience, the uh, whole kit and caboodle. So I want to know right off the bat which trailers stood out to you, or did any trailers stand out to you? Dude, all the trailers these days are really like all the same thing, you know? Like you never the thing I hate trailers because it's just using the inception boom now, you know? You're like, and like big oh dark music was supposed to like be really invested. So nothing really grabs my attention, but the one that really hooked me, Snitch. Okay. That one has got me invested. You know, you can never go wrong with the rock. And right. it's a father son story. So big, like big I am, break out yeah, here for the rock. Big season. break, yeah. Four movies the rocks are coming out. And this one is like the least known out of all of them. So I'm expecting this one to be like the heavy punching hitter. Like this one's gonna be, I think, if any chance of showing the rock as an actor, it'll be this one. Yeah, I mean it looked pretty cool. I'd have to say you're probably gonna see a lot of the rock shooting people in this movie. Oh uh, yeah, of course. Well I'm wondering what, what the rock does. Yeah. Why would we see this movie if the rock's not killing people? You know, we're not watching the tooth fairy. It's yet. pretty much why I go to see him, yeah. yeah. Alright, so you like Snitch. Um Snitch looks good. Let's get down to it. The last end. Oh uh, man. Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a sheriff. Sheriff Ray Owens. Border town in Arizona. Uh there's a court a cartel dealer just speeding toward the border, trying to go through Arnold's town. A stolen core. That. Stolen Corvette that's faster than a helicopter. Faster than a moving <laughs> helicopter. Driven by a professional race car driver. <laughs> this guy has just got the biggest list of credentials. I've, you know, he's he can, he can do anything. I want to, so real quick, what stuck out to you about this movie? Oh, well, what immediately stuck out to me in the beginning was, you know, the Western themes that uh, this movie just has sprinkled on throughout the entirety of the film. Yeah, I, I mean, I could see that. You have you have a sheriff in a small one horse town, like we said. Uh, he's really he's, he's making his last stand, if you will, no, in this see, town. Right, trying right, to, you have the title of the movie. Trying trying to defend all that's right and good. I I, yeah. I I guess I agree with you. I thought it was a little bit campy though. I thought uh, basically they took the worst parts about western movies and mixed them with eighties action movies and. Really just wasn't doing it for me. Well, I mean, that's the essence of Schwarzenegger. I mean, when you see a movie like him, you're going to expect if it's a big action, like, kind of, kind because it's not really a Western movie. It's more, it's still a modern action movie. Right. But it sprinkles those little bits of the Western themes in there. Like, I'm not saying, like, they did it masterfully, but they still had nice moments of sprinkling them about, you know, like this last stand in this town, and this sheriff is the only competent person to hold hit, to hold out and, like, save the day. Right. Like, the law's not going to do anything. His deputies aren't going to do anything. Like, Luis Guzman's a goon. The other guy was a drunk. Johnny Knoxville was certifiably insane. Yeah, I, I mean, and don't even get me started on Johnny Knoxville. I'm, I'm getting so sick of that guy. What do you have against, but, what, what do you have against Johnny Knoxville? I just, I don't know. I, I just don't know how you make a career out of jackass but somehow Johnny Knoxville's managed to do it pretty much Johnny uh, Knoxville has taken his laugh that he perfected getting hit in the balls in jackass and just applies that to each and every character right I've seen exactly every he's just the same laugh man. and he's certifiably insane but I mean you know it just goes to show Schwarzenegger is the only hope in this town because he's seen what's coming he knows what's gonna happen yeah I mean I, I no you're right there's there's some western views yeah. in there uh just as a fan of westerns, it maybe even put me off a little bit that they were in there, because it, it was it seemed so uh, like, like you arrived almost. You, you were know? just waiting for like the tumbleweed to come across. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it just I don't know. It just didn't do it for me. I, I guess I'm just a purist yeah. when it comes you to just, westerns. You need your westerns to be hardcore <laughs> westerns. You can't just settle for this little campy. Right. Exactly. Um, 
All right, let's move on. One of the one of the few things I did like uh, was the villain in this movie, Cortez. Gabriel Cortez, Gabriel leader of Cortez. the cartels. Uh, we did mention before that he was he's a professional race car driver. Third generation cartel. <laughs> Third leader. generation cartel leader. Like this man has just had like if this guy had a resume to get a job in like the drug world, he'd be at the top of the food chain. Yeah. Like everyone would be trying to hire this guy. I mean, yeah, I I think this is one of the few things they did a good job with. Just because he was such a badass villain. Um, he, like you said, professional yeah. race car driver, cartel leader. Stone Cold Killer. The guy was nut, just the way he drove. He's a badass villain, and it's and uh, uh, that's what makes it like really cool about being the villain is that like what you always have to do in a script or work towards is like you need to understand your vi- the villain's coherent worldview. Right. Like, yeah. And this is what I loved about it. They they didn't just take a badass villain. They sort of developed that badass yeah. villain as a character. Like it's surprising to see that like the most developed person in the movie is this villain. Right. You know? he, he was pretty much my favorite part. The whole the whole scene where he's explaining um, that you won't see death coming. Right. Death. You won't see death coming. Basically, I think he got up to go get a glass of milk, and his niece, who he loved and taken care of all his life was waiting there to kill him. And he killed her and did the did a terrible thing, I guess, and killed her. But it, it was just cool to see that development where so this is how this guy thinks. Yeah. He's not afraid of, of death in a speeding race car or in a drug deal or anything like that trying to escape captivity. Exactly. He's more afraid of death in the shadows. And yeah. then you see then the motivation for how he drives and like all the bad so things. That race car drive. Yeah. And like he's just got a great worldview. You see that he's fearless and believes that like he can speed all the way down to Arizona and get across the border and home free because he's just that fearless of a man that he doesn't believe in this like hardcore environment that he's going to die. It's, a, it's another western trope right there. He lives in this just horrifying world of his view, and he believes that, like, what he's doing is absolute worst. He's not gonna die. Yeah, it's when he lets his it's guard down for that one that moment, one second, yeah. and so I it mean, stabs him in the back. I, I, I guess, yeah. I mean, my, the villain was my favorite part of this movie. I don't yeah. know if I've made that clear enough yet. I think you've, <laughs> you've stated your stance on that very well. That's what makes it so much greater when he like he finally loses at the end. Is like when he finally puts that fear into him that he's not going to get to the border. He's right. just throwing and out money sums at Schwarzenegger. Like he's willing to pay twenty million to Schwarzenegger just so that he can make it to the border and be free. Like it was a it was a cool way to develop him because he finally reaches that point when he loses in the fight with Schwarzenegger that. He understands he's going to die doing this. He understands it's all over. He's going to get caught, and he's going to go to jail, yeah. and there's nothing he can do about it. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the development for the villain was cool. The way he hit at the end, I loved. Uh, with that said, that's pretty much the only thing I love from this movie. <laughs> um, we're going to segue now. Just, uh, I want to ask you about Forrest Whitaker in this movie. What did you think of Forrest Whitaker? Horace Whitaker, it surprises me more and more that this man was actually an Academy Award-nominated actor. To see, like, his such a fall far from grace, like, he's just... I don't know. I, was, I personally cannot stand Forrest Whitaker. He was bad in this movie. Forrest Whitaker <laughs> is just bad. He was bad in this movie. He, he, he played the, uh, the FBI agent that was hunting down Cortez. Um... They were transporting Cortez in the beginning, and and I somebody leaks the girl, some girl that works for Whitaker leaks when they're moving him, and and basically he's hunting down this guy the whole movie. He's always one step behind him, and that's more than one step behind. Forrest Whitaker's like six steps behind this guy the whole time. He's always so far behind. Forrest Whitaker never even had a chance to be the one to take down this guy. He was so fucking incompetent. The thing that fucked me though was his acting. (laughs) <laughs> there's, there's these intense He's just moments. not a believable actor anymore. Like, right, there's these intense moments in the movie where he's getting beaten by the cartel. He's not finding this guy. He's not hunting him down. And you can see him getting like heated about what's going on. and like More on that hinge. But like, he just yeah. doesn't... It, he I don't convey that emotion well It enough. just seems like he's reading a line and yelling. only one eye can show emotion. <laughs> His left eye is... His left eye thing. just can't show any emotion. <laughs> It was just distracting. He wasn't very good. I didn't like. I didn't like the the girl who actually betrayed the FBI. She was a worthless character. She, I mean, like, like 
pretty much in this in this movie, the only two people really got good character developments was the villain and then Schwarzenegger gets that little background where like he came from LA, he's seen blood, but like it was this it was so chick, quick and over like undone though. Like, there was yeah. no real development there for Schwarzenegger. It was just he had this past and like we're gonna tell you two things about the past and we're gonna move on. Like that was their character's version. But like this girl literally had like nothing. It was all right. She gets in the car. We think she's kidnapped. Oh, and then they start driving. And he takes the handcuffs off. We find oh. She was in on it. She basically had three scenes yeah. where anything at all happened to her character, yeah. and I didn't care about it went, any one of them. It went first scene, she gets kidnapped. Second scene, we find out she was really working with the villain. Third, Third scene, scene, she, she gets arrested. arrested. And that's like, it. there was really no reason for her to be there other than to give the bad guy that speech to say about death. Which, I mean, is fun, but, like, you could have added a little bit more with this girl to make it a little bit more, like, right, which I sound, mean, you know? I guess she helped in the deepest part of the movie, but yeah. she really, really didn't need to be there. Yeah. Um, outside of that, I mean, we could move on to Schwarzenegger's future. I want to ask you about this, just because I know that we're going to see a lot more of Arnold Schwarzenegger coming up. Uh, There's that's... definitely going to be some sequels here. Yeah. Not for the last stand, but... For, for Terminator, you got to think there's going to be another sequel. Oh, they've already said that they're going to get Right, Terminator. there's another it's Conan coming out. Movie yeah, like you Conan coming out. I just, so what do, you, what do you think about this? Because The Last Night didn't do good in the box office. I think it was something like million. 6.2 million for an opening weekend. And that's horrible. Uh, opened the ninth place. Opened the ninth place in, in November. It's not November. It's not November, it's January. <laughs> in January. I think you're losing your mind a little. Yes. Yeah. Open, open up a ninth place in January. Not really a hot time for movies. Yeah, uh, a bad time for movies, but you still had, like, Mama opened up with, like, 20 million. Right, right exactly. Like, it still shows that in January market, right, you're going to make some dough. Right. So, I mean, where, where do you think Schwarzenegger goes from here? And more importantly, are you excited for where Schwarzenegger goes from here? Personally, me, yes, I am excited. Because, you know, it's, it's Schwarzenegger. You're like, it doesn't matter what Schwarzenegger's doing. Like, if you've been a Schwarzenegger fan from before when he did movies, like, you're going to see his movies now. Like, sure, I don't know what happened with The Last Stand, you know, probably, you know, it didn't get a lot of good marketing or whatever the whole reason was. But for the people that did saw it, everyone that I've spoken to that saw it enjoyed it, with the exception of you for the most part. Right, and, and, and you liked the movie, yeah, right? I, yeah, I completely enjoyed the movie because, you know, you know, I enjoy just seeing Schwarzenegger you know, cheese his way through dialogue, kick some ass. A lot, and, a lot of one liners. A lot of one liners. But like what was great about this, like it had a little it had that little extra mile, like the villain was a bit more developed than I thought it would be. And it had a cool ending scene. Like it was a lot violent and more bloody than I thought it would be. So it was a nice addition too. And like it's just fun to see Schwarzenegger back in movies again. Cause you know, he's like he is a fucking star. He is a star. He's a star. So like for the future, like he's got another movie coming out in September, The Tomb, you know, it's Sylvester Stallone, and God knows that movie's gonna get an abysmal opening too. Right. It's gonna do horrible. But will I be there to see it? Hell yeah, I'll be there to and see it. And you'll probably be yeah. entertained. And I'll probably be entertained because it's fucking Schwarzenegger. I would watch him take a shit in the toilet, and I would spend eleven fifty to see it. All right. I mean, so yeah, you're you're not you're not turning away from Schwarzenegger not, in the future. I'm not turning away from him at all. When Terminator Five comes out, I'll be there. When Conan comes out, I'll be there. You know? I I think I agree with you there. I, I'm definitely gonna see a Terminator Five if it comes out. Yeah. I'll probably see the new Conan movie. I don't know if I'm gonna see Tomb. Uh but I, I just think after this movie, I'm a little bit less excited for those movies. It, it wasn't quite the big extravagant return I was that you would expect it to be. And I mean at the end of the day I would much rather just rewatch movies like Commando or or um, Total Recall, Predator, Predator. Yeah. I'd yeah. rather just rewatch movies that he had like that movies. than have him try and rehash those movies thirty years later. That's just me, though. I don't know. Um, and I think, that, his own. I think that about does it for the last end. I've seen enough blood and death. I know what's coming. All right, we're just about getting done here with this podcast. Um, the end of every episode, basically, I, your host, I'm going to ask our movie analyst here a random question that I come up with for the week. Right. Uh, it's Let's do it. January, beginning of the year. Uh, we should wrap this one up with a little bit of predictions for the future. The future is now! I <laughs> love that drop. Anytime you can get Jim Carrey involved, I'm a fan of that. Um, all right, so my question to you. Uh, I want to know what movie you think is going to 
finish with the highest grossing for 2013. Oh, now, before you say anything, that's a. I want to throw our front runner out there as Iron Man 3. Uh, I, I mean, think if we really got down to it, we could both agree that's probably going to make the most money this yeah. year. If you look at it, there, uh, there are a lot of good ones coming out this year, but I think you would have to give it. I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is on such a high note right now. The Avengers tallied in. Avengers, like, I think. The Avengers, one and a half billion. billion. Like, everyone else out of the water. 1.115 billion fucking dollars. A lot of money. That's <laughs> a lot of money. A lot of money. You know, and so, Iron Man 3 is going to, you know, it's it's going to reflect on that. So if we agree, Iron Man 3 is probably our front runner. Uh, I'm going to toss a couple names at you. I want to know which you think is our best Dark Horse candidate to, Dark to Horse challenge Man. Iron Man 3 for this guy. Okay. All right, let's hear some names. Rattle them off to me. I'm going to, let's start with Star Trek. Ooh, it's a good one, an interesting one. Star Trek in the Darkness. It's been, what, the first Star Trek came out in 2009? I, I want to say 2009. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we had 10, 11, 12. But it's been four years since we had the last one. I mean, it it definitely will get up there. There are definitely a lot of Trekkies. Can't discount the Trekkies. Yeah, you can't discount the Star Trek. There are a lot of Trekkies out there. And I mean, like, even me, like, I never watched any of the original TV show or any of the old movies, but I saw the new Star Trek and I loved it. So, like, I'm like this new, I'm like kind of like the new modern day Trekkies. Right, right. You got to imagine that there's going to be a bunch of other modern day Trekkies. And I can imagine Star Trek. Just with how solid the original movie did. Yeah, the original one did about 600 million. So like you can imagine that now, I would imagine Star Trek in the darkness will get up into the high 700 million range, maybe top 800, but I don't think it's going to be Iron Man. It doesn't sound like you're it buying into no, Iron Man. No, I'm not, not, I'm not buying into the hype that it would beat Iron Man because I I am almost positive that Iron Man three is gonna is gonna get to a billion dollars. I mean, I, I'd say yeah. Like, after everything the Avengers movie. did, and then to just continue to carry that momentum into Iron Man three, people are real excited about what that universe is gonna do next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so you don't think yeah. Star Trek's gonna no, make Star it? Trek's not just doing keep just looking, the names. Keep just looking at the rest of our names. I think that would be my pick. Um, Star Trek. Star Trek. Star Trek for your pick. Uh, yeah, that's that's just with me knowing that's... what I'm about to say to you, though. You don't know what I'm going to say. That's probably... true. What is the next? Let's go on uh, the Hobbit. Ooh! If anyone could dethrone Iron Man three, I would have to pick the Hobbit as that dark horse, because I mean, let's the the one that just came out this year was it. It was good by all means, but you left a little bit unsatisfied because, like, you were waiting to see that dragon. Right, well, any, any like, time you break a book, any time, movies, yeah. you know, any time, the first especially, one's not going to be that Especially with The Hobbit, which is, like, a short enough book as it is, right. and we're going to cut that into three. So, like, of course, like, everyone was, like, th- like a little with that said, the, salty taste. The first, that. the first Hobbit movie still broke 900 million. Yeah, it still, yeah, it made 900 million, and it was just the opening of this tale. And by all means, it was still bad. And now, like, the second one is the meat and potatoes. Like, this is where right, we're gonna get, really like, the dragon's going to come out now. Like, we're going to see some, like, badassery. Like, Thor and Oakenshield's going to kick some ass. Like, the Hobbit's going to break a billion. Will it beat Iron Man 3? Very questionable. I think if anyone could dethrone Iron Man 3, it's going to be the Hobbit. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, That's... I think just looking at the last name, I think you're going to stick with the Hobbit here. <laughs> let's hear. Let's, uh, let's, let's hear what we got. Catching Fire. Ooh. The Hunger Games movie. Second Hunger Games movie. Ah, uh, continuing the Hunger Games. Uh, we all know my stance on the Hunger Games. Love Jennifer Lawrence. Hate the movie. But Catching Fire is not going to. Break. It's not even going to beat Star Trek. I don't think. I, I was I was a little bit surprised. Uh, I put this on this list before actually looking up the, the, the numbers. The tally for uh, the first Hunger Games movie. The first yeah. Hunger Games movie. It did well. Um, it, six, I mean, 600 million was good. Didn't, that's didn't that's something quite proud of. close to a billion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I expected the people who read that stupid book to really go out there and see oh, this yeah. movie. So now that like Twilight's done and everything, we're going to be getting a lot more fans for the Hunger Games. And by all means, I'm sure Catching Fire is still going to do a lot of good business. I think what threw me off was just how big the Harry Potter movies were. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I, when you look back at it, I don't think you can say Hunger Games is, like, nearly yeah, as yeah, much of a really pop is. culture thing as Harry yeah. Potter. Like, pretty much it's mostly teen girls still that are reading the Hunger Games. Granted, there are some guys out there reading the Hunger Games and everything. You know, whoever it is that's actually reading these bad books. Uh, I mean, it'll, it'll do good. I imagine that it will get up to in the 600 range again. Yeah, Maybe yeah. even top 700, but no, I don't it, it, I don't think, I don't it think has, it's going to quite I don't think it has one shot at all of beating Iron Man 3. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, it looks like you're sticking with The Hobbit. Yeah, I think I, I, 
My Dark Horse pick's going to be Star Trek. Um, I'm going to stick with The Hobbit on that. I think The Hobbit is going to take shit down in 2013. <laughs> and we both agree that Iron Man 3 is going to be well, we, can always go, we can always go for a real, real, real Dark Horse pain and game. <laughs> we just have to see it 6,000 times so I like, really get that budget up there. Right, uh, and we get a good word of mouth going. Like That's what, we, that's what we're telling people right now. Everybody out there in the world right now, you see pain and game the day it comes out. Let's make a real dark horse. No one will see that shit coming. I don't think Pain and Gain is going to break $200 million. No. But, <laughs> <laughs> you're going with The Hobbit. I'm, I'm going, going with, with Star Hobbit. Trek. We both think Iron Man 3 is going to win. Yeah. Um, Iron Man 3 definitely looks to be the we'll winning take, champion. We'll take a look at this, I guess, back in December, uh, a year from now. <laughs> but um, oh, yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll get back to that and see how we did on those picks. Um, and that's it for the show. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. Oh, yeah. Uh, can we just, can I just say how excited I am for this movie? I'm pretty I, excited. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited, excited for this movie. It's an R-rated Hansel and Gretel movie. The fact I, that it got an R is, 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 is yeah, really that's, drawing me at this point. That's what's drawing me. If it was PG-13, we wouldn't be doing this, but very excited about this. All right. All and right. Thank you for joining us. There I'm we go. I'm host, James O'Reilly, esteemed movie analyst, TJ Tromboli. We'll talk to you next week. It's good to see you. Take care. Good night.